I'm an assistant professor at Boise State University. I did my uh, PhD with Randy Levesque, and so I've been working with, you know, I, I've worked on similar things that David George works on, although I'll have to admit not directly on the tsunami modeling stuff, but more generally on wave propagation algorithms, volume schemes, um, on, on various types of grid, adaptive mesh refinement has been the thing I've looked at mostly. So, but what I wanted to do today was talk about sort of an important piece of the GeoClaw package. So those of you who've been looking at GeoClaw have been running and, and have had it all set up really nicely and have seen, um, have, uh, you know, seen the results of, of, of years of effort in, in solving the shallow water wave equations with this complicated bathymetry. And so what I thought I would do today is focus on one tiny piece of these schemes, and that's this, the Riemann solution for the one-dimensional linear, nonlinear shallow water wave equations. Okay, this is sort of the heart of, of, of a finite volume scheme. That's today. Tomorrow we'll talk about approximate Riemann solvers in GeoClaw. So what is GeoClaw really doing behind the scenes? Um, I'll say a few things about the accuracy of the method and how, how, how accuracy is actually obtained. Um, and ex some extensions to higher dimensions. And then if I get to it, I'll talk about this well-balancing approach because it may tie in. It actually is done through the Riemann solver. And then finally, on Friday, I'll talk about adaptive mesh refinement, okay, that's used in GeoClaw. So the shallow water wave equations, which we've, I think most of you are familiar with at this point, are, and I'm going to look at the 1D equations. It's a coupled system of, of two equations. First equation is for a height, average height field. Second equation is for momentum. Uh, this is the, so the nonlinear version, of course. It's an example of a system of equations written in conservative form. And more generally, we can write it as, uh, let's see if I can do this. One of these buttons will advance the slides. In, in, in general, we can write a conservation law in this form, where Q is some vector of conserved quantities. In this case, it might be H and UH. And F is a flux function. And in this case, the flux function is also a vector whose components are UH and this sort of more complicated expression here. And I'll say a little bit more about what this looks like in the shallow water case, but for now, we, we just kind of imagine that, that there are, in fact, many equations that can be written in this particular form, and they often come from physical conservation laws that are expressing the idea that we want to preserve mass, momentum, energy, species, and so on. Um, so GeoClaw, of course, is based on solving these equations um, in 2D, but, but a lot of what I say in 1D will, will in fact carry over to 2D, um, using a finite volume method. The heart of many finite volume methods, including GeoClaw, is a Riemann solver, which is used to compute numerical fluxes. And if you've dug around in the GeoClaw code at all, you'll find files that look like this, RPN2, which is a normal Riemann, RP stands for Riemann problem. And the N, in this case, would stand for normal, and the T stands for transverse, the 2 stands for two-dimensional, and the geo is simply added as part of, because it's actually the, the Riemann solver used in GeoClaw. So what I'm basically going to be explaining today is, well, I, in fact, what, what I'm going to explain tomorrow is what's actually in these files. Today, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background as to what, what one needs to think about when solving, you know, what is a Riemann problem, okay? So we start with a, a, a conservation law that looks like this. And again, our, our Q is a vector of conserved quantities. F is some flux function. And we think about discretizing this on a, on a one-dimensional domain where um, we have cells whose edges are given by, say, an xi minus a half, xi plus a half. This is just some indice indexing that's used. And we imagine our numerical solution as being the the volume average of our true solution over this cell, okay? So what we're actually thinking when we, when we solve something like GeoClaw, we're actually getting not a pointwise value to the solution, but actually a cell average value to the solution, okay? An approximation to the cell average, I should say, all right? And so the first thing to ask is, well, how does a how does a cell average actually evolve? If this is our PDE, well, we can imagine integrating both sides of this equation. So we can pull out the DT, and we get that the time rate of change of the average is equal to the uh, time, is equal to the, um, I've integrated in space here, is e equal to the spatial integral of our uh, fluxes. 
And of course, uh, let's see, this is a DDX in here, so we can apply a little bit of calculus and simply evaluate our flux function at the endpoints. So basically, the time rate of change of our average quantity is going to be related to flux flowing in and out of the edges of a cell. Okay? Um, uh, so this is that same statement again. If we actually integrate this in time, we can write down an exact expression for the, for the time average value at time, say, time, some time level n plus 1 is equal to the average value at some time level n times uh, plus the integral, the average value in time now, of the difference of these fluxes. Okay? And this piece right here is the thing that we need to figure out how to compute. Okay? That's kind of the heart of a finite volume scheme. So if we can do that, we can come up with what are called numerical fluxes, which would be these time average values of a numerical flux. If somehow we can manage to figure out what the average value of the flux is at each edge, we can call those things, say, big F, and we can write down a standard finite volume scheme looks like this. So Qn at the new time level is equal to the average value at the old time level minus and here we've taken some discrete a time step and a spatial scale minus the difference of fluxes. And if we sort of rearrange this a little bit, we'll notice it looks very, this form here looks very much like our original conservation law. So here looks, this looks something like a time derivative, and this looks something like the spatial derivative of our flux function. Okay? Um, so the trick, though, is going to be to figure out what is this average? So what am I asking? I'm asking, I have a flux function, which we presume is given for the shallow water wave equations. I showed it to you there. Um, it's a function of Q, so it involves our state variables, height and momentum, for example. We're asking it to evaluate the flux function at a Q that lives at a cell edge. So this is a cell edge right here. But in fact, what we're really given as data are average values in each cell. So if we think of our solution, our solution is kind of a piecewise constant solution in each cell. And yet I'm saying, I'm asking the question, what's the flux at this edge? Well, I have no idea what the flux is at that edge because I have no idea what, what is Q. I'm asking to evaluate F at some Q. Well, Q, is it Q left or is it Q right or is it something in between? Who knows, right? All we need to know is, well, what happens? So what you have to imagine is that we really want to know, and then, and then we, not only do we want to know that, we want to know what's the time average value of this thing. Okay, like what's it going to do in the future? Not even what's it doing now. What's it going to do in the future? Well, this leads to a classic problem, which is known as a Riemann problem. So we start with our conservation law, and we ask the question, what happens if I start with, piecewise constant data on the left and the right as initial data, and I simply attempt to solve this equation. And you might think, well, wait a second, that's what I'm trying to do discreetly. Why would I now make my life complicated by deciding that I'm actually going to have to solve this analytically before I can solve it discreetly? Well, that's in fact exactly what we do. Okay? And the reason that this works and this is the, what I'm going to explain today, is because it turns out with this very special data, we can actually solve this analytically. Okay? That's not to say that's what we do in all numerical methods. We often will come up with an approximate solver to the analytic solution. But, but the fact is we can solve it analytically, and this is the basis for, for a wide variety of numerical methods. So just in pictures, what sort of happens here? Imagine opening a floodgate right here. Okay? We've got some water level here, some less water here. Something's going to happen. Water's going to rush from here to here. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. Okay? But after some amount of time, so this is maybe at t equals 0, at time t greater than 0, something happened. And what we care about is exactly the solution along this ray. And it turns out that one of the properties of, this, of the Riemann problem, again, because we have this very special data, is that whatever happens, this solution will now remain constant for a finite, a small time, okay, a delta t time step. And it's exactly this q value right here that we're going to use to evaluate, to evaluate our flux. Okay? So we're going to take this q star value, which we call an intermediate state, 
and we're going to evaluate our flux function at that Q star value, and this will give us our numerical flux, and this is the basis for sort of what's called a, a classical Godunov type of approach to solving hyperbolic conservation laws. Um, Patrick referred to, you know, methods, shock capturing methods, methods which resolve shocks, and this is exactly the type of method that, that would do that, okay? Um, it does, though, require that you solve a little conservation law at every single cell interface, and so this is sometimes why they're not used so widely, because this is viewed as, as, mm -hmm. as expensive, perhaps overkill, um, but what we try to argue is that, in fact, it, it, leads, to, it leads to superior results and could be done quite, uh, quite efficiently. Um, so let's just, may, I want to make one, one, you know, we talk about conservation laws. Why is the finite volume scheme interesting? Let me just say, uh, say a quick word here. Suppose I wanted to know what the time rate of change of Q over our, an entire domain, not just a single cell, but say over an entire domain, XA, XB. Well, the time rate of change over an entire domain is exactly equal to what comes in at the left edge minus what comes in at the right edge. Again, this is because we have things in conservative form, and calculus just basically allows us to compute this integral exactly. So if we now replace this with a, a finite sum in the discrete case, we can ask, well, what's the sum? of Since Q is a cell average, I can add up these Qs and get something meaningful. Couldn't do that with a pointwise value. Um, well, it's the, the sum of stuff, say mass or momentum, at the new time level is equal to the sum of stuff at the old time level minus the sum, now here's where the discrete formula for fluxes comes in, okay, the sum of all my fluxes, but if you noticed what happens, since every one of these fluxes is evaluated at an edge, we have sort of a telescoping thing going on, if you remember your uh, sequences and series, right? So, so this thing uh, telescopes out, and what we're left with are fluxes at the endpoints. So the only way that the flux, at the, that the total mass at the new time level can change is if the mass is, is due to fluxes at the, at the edges of our domain. And of course, if those are zero, which they're often set to is for, say, Neumann boundary conditions, then our mass doesn't change, our energy doesn't change, our momentum doesn't change, and we're numerically exactly conservative. And that's of, of great importance in a lot of problems, especially in these shot capturing problems. Okay. So now I want to sort of back up to a really simple um, scalar advection problem. Okay. Uh, so, because this is going to be sort of the, it, it turns out that, that uh, we can understand a lot about how to solve a Riemann problem by looking at this really simple case. So now we have a scalar Q, we have some constant, constant velocity field U, and we have some initial condition. Some of you who are in, the, in Ridge's lab on, on Monday actually solved this problem, okay? So we have some initial condition given by an eta. And it's easy to show that the solution to this problem is simply eta evaluated at x minus ut, okay? So you can simply just take this q, put it back into the PDE, differentiate with respect to time, differentiate with respect to space, and you can exactly show that, that you get zero, okay? Um, so what did we, what are, another way to look at this is to describe the problem in terms of how the solution behaves along curves in the xt plane. And now this xt plane is something I'm going to talk about a lot, so you have to sort of start to think now about what this means. But let's imagine that we're going to look for curves in the xt plane. So and I, I, I sh I'll have a picture in the next slide. So imagine, uh, imagine x of t and t as being a, a sort of points in, a, in an xt plane, along which the solution remains constant. Okay? So we simply differentiate this thing, d dt of q at x of prime of t, apply our chain rule, we get qx times x prime plus q of t, and this will be equal to zero if, okay, here's that same expression, this is only true, so it'll be only equal to zero if x prime of t is u bar, or if I integrate this, x of t is u of t plus x zero. What does that mean? If I start at some x zero, the solution will remain constant along curves that look like this that are described by this parameterization, you could say, okay? So when I say xt plane, again, I mean x is in this direction, and t 
T is the vertical. So, don't confuse this graph with what you might often see, you know, where I've plotted the solution to Q. So, what we most will see is, is, is T in the vertical and X in the horizontal and, and things like this going out. So, the solution is always going to propagate along these constant, what are straight lines, and they're straight lines because of this right here, okay? The slope is constant. <coughs> so, this is in fact another way to get the solution, right? So, the solution can be traced back along characteristics. That is, if Q of X of T can be found by determining X0 from, from the X, finding the X0 from which the solution propagated. So, here I'm sitting here at, at some uh, Q value. Up here, I have some, some X and some Q. I want to know, where did my solution come from? Well, I set X equal to UT plus X0. Okay, I solve for X0. Well, X0 is X minus UT. And I say, ah, my solution came from this X0. So, Q at XT is just Q at X0 at T0, which is equal to that. And that's exactly the same thing that, that I showed you at the, in the first slide, okay? So, nice, just a, a quick picture of this. And now here I have it running left to right, or right to left, I, I don't know. Anyway, so here you can see the solution propagating along. Here we see what would, here's the Q. So, this is Q here, and this is the XT plane. And any one of the slices in T is exactly this solution in Q. So, you see, you see each of these, these dots moving to the left, you know, corresponds to the solution kind of propagating along these straight lines. Okay, so this is sort of the way to think about this scalar advection problem. All right, another way to think about it, again, the same type of problem. So, we, this is a, we can describe a Riemann problem for this. What's the Riemann problem? Well, it's our, our conservation law um, plus left and right data. So, we have left data, right data. The solution propagates along these characteristics. Um, what's the solution? Well, it depends on if x minus u of t is less than zero. That is, if we're over here somewhere, the solution's going to be q left. Again, constant data. Um, or if x of t is greater than zero, that is, if we're over here, our solution is going to be the Q-right solution, okay? So that, that's, that's sort of the simplest version of a Riemann problem. The solution, and this is often what we do when we upwind, right? We ask ourselves, what's the solution along this straight edge here? Well, it's the upwinded <coughs> solution. In this case, U bar is positive, so the U is moving in this direction. Stuff is moving from the, from the left to the right, so the solution is really the left solution in this case. And this is, again, just a fancier, same, same, exact same information, graphically a little different, because what we often want to think about is the solution along rays that look like this. Along a red ray like this, this quantity x divided by t is greater than u bar. That is greater than the slope of this line. Here, this blue ray here has a slope that's less than the slope of this black line. And so we could think of our x and t point as being along this ray, and then we might ask, okay, Q of X of T is either a left or right state, depending on what X or T is doing. And this, this is kind of important because this actually comes up a lot. So again, this is just another way to write down the solution to the Riemann problem for this, for this, for this particular conservation law. Um, uh, and, and just, you know, whoops. Um, Oh well, so, the, so that had, I, had, I think I had a movie there, but, uh, but for some reason it's not playing, but I guess that, that's okay. Um, all right, so what's, what's more, it gets more interesting when we think about linear systems, okay? So constant coefficient linear system, all right? And, and we'll use as example the linearized shallow water wave equations, which I'll get to in a minute. So, but for now, just think of A as being a, con, a matrix, a four by, uh, an M by M matrix. That's diagonalizable, and that we require, otherwise the system is not hyperbolic, okay? So it's diagonalizable, and it has real eigenvectors and a complete set of, uh, excuse me, complete set of eigenvectors and real eigenvalues, okay? So we can write it like this. And we'll use this notation, our eigenvectors are given by R1, R2 out to Rm, and our eigenvalues are lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda m, okay? So examples, linearized shallow water wave equations, constant coefficient acoustics, et cetera, okay? Um, well, we can replace the A here with an R lambda R inverse, okay? 
Again, we're assuming A is diagonalizable. Omega is now, we're going we're to redefine redef what are called characteristic variables. So now omega is going to be R inverse times Q. So R inverse, of course, contains left eigenvectors. So we'll just simply, um, and R omega at time 0 is simply R inverse times Q0. And um, this will lead to an, a characteristic equation. So if I put R0, if I multiply this through by R0, I'll get a characteristic equation of decoupled scalar advection equations I'll get a system of advection equations, okay, because lambdas are now scalar, for these sort of <coughs> characteristic variables, okay, where the initial conditions are given by the initial, our initial Q values, okay. So, um, so what, is this, what does this look like kind of in pictures? Here's our, again, our, what we're thinking of is a scalar conservation law. And strictly speaking, it may look like it's not in conservation form, but I could easily have put the, the, the put parentheses around A and Q and put that differentiate with respect to X. You know, I could have called my flux function A times Q because A is constant. Anyway, so we've rewritten it in, in this, this form here. So what is the solution? Well, Q is R times omega because we said omega was R inverse Q, okay? Um, which, if we think of this as the columns of R, are simply our eigenvectors. And uh, so, so the solution is really then just our characteristic, ver a sort of uh, a linear combination of eigenvectors where the weights are given by these characteristic variables. Okay? And if we trace back, each, each characteristic variable is traced back along its own characteristic. So, in fact, the solution can be written exactly in terms of, in terms of our initial data. Okay, so what does that mean? If I'm a point sitting up here, it now means that I'm getting information from three different places. Okay, I'm getting information from, from this location here based on this sort of characteristic lambda 1 speed. I'm getting information from here based on this lambda 2 speed and information from here based on this lambda 3 speed. Okay, and you can think of these characteristic variables as being left eigenvectors times R Q as a, times RQ, okay? Um, but that's not, I haven't really described the Riemann problem yet. The Riemann problem is exactly this problem, and again, I'll, I guess I'll specify R3, uh, given constant initial data, left, Q left and Q right, not just kind of arbitrary. What I described in the previous slide was, was work for any initial data. Here I have constant initial data, where I've decomposed my constant initial data into a Q left and a Q right. Okay, this, um, and so now we have to ask, okay, what is the solution here? I'm at, again, we have our xt plane. This is t increases in the vertical direction. x is along here, and our initial data is really uh, left state is on the left side, a right state on the right side, piece, so piecewise constant initial data. What does a q look like at this x1? Well. It travel, I have three speeds now I have to worry about, but since I'm sort of far enough to the left, everything has come from the left. So Q at this location, X1, is, is again given by this linear combination of eigenvectors, but it's really just Q left, okay? So the, and the weights are all taken from the left, the left sort of domain. But what happens when I move this, oh, when, I, when this, this guy here, Suddenly, this, this one wave, this one at lambda one, it sticks over into the right-hand side. Well, so what happened to my solution? Suddenly, these two are still coming from the left, but suddenly now I have something from the right here, and that shows up right here. So the, 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 uh, the linear combination, I still have the same three eigenvectors, they're constant, but the weights have now changed. One of the weights is now coming from data taken from Q right. And if I continue this, now two of the weights are taken from the Q right, and one of the weights, and the only remaining weight is, is taken from, from Q left. Okay, and finally, when, when I'm far enough over, all the data is coming from the right state. Okay, so now we're back, we just have our Q right solution. So what does the final solution look like? Well, it's piecewise constant, except that now it's kind of separated out into three different constant states. 
each of these states where the only, all the eigenvectors are the same, so each state is some linear combination of eigenvectors, and in this case, all the weights are from the left state. Here, one of them is from the right state. Here, two are from the right state, and here, all three are from the right state, and that's how we jump from, from state to state. So now the question is, well, what is this jump here? Okay, you know, what's the magnitude? What, what am I doing when I go from this state to this state? And it should be hopefully clear that when we go from this state to this state, well, I, all I did was change this first weight. So really the difference between these two states <laughs> is some, is in fact a scalar multiple of the first eigenve eigenvector, okay? So this jump is exactly it's in the direction of our first eigenvector. So you can guess what this jump is. It's going to be something, it's a scalar multiple of the second eigenvector, and this jump is going to be a scalar multiple of the third eigenvector, okay? Keep in mind that all these Q's are all vectors, right? Even though the picture I've drawn looks, makes it look like it's a scalar value, the color really just represents a particular eigenvector, okay? So here, the difference between Q, X, uh, something in here and something in here, the on, these two are now the same, the only difference is now here. And so the difference between that, these two states is really some scalar multiple of our second eigenvector. And the difference of, again, the, the final two states is a scalar multiple of the third eigenvector. Okay, so we can write this out, the difference between the final, st our Q left and our Q right, our uh, Q right minus Q left, is now been decomposed into a series of jumps. Each jump has a weight given by this difference here. And the way we write that is it's, you know, the jump has been decomposed into eigenvectors, okay, where these alphas now are the weights that decompose the jump. So really what we could have done to start all this, we could have said, well, let's just find the eigenvalue decomposition of Q right minus Q left. That is, let's figure out how to write decompose Q right minus Q left as a linear combination of eigenvectors. And in fact, that's exactly what we do in solving this linear constant coefficient Riemann problem. Okay? We compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix A. We compute the characteristic variables, what we now call characteristic variables alpha. Okay? We sort of uh, abandon the omega notation and simply call them alpha. And then we can write down our exact solution at any one time as being a left state plus however many jumps we had to go over to get to that xt. Okay, it may be all of them depending on, depending on how x and t compares to each, each speed. Okay, maybe one leg went over, maybe two legs went over, maybe all three made it over. Okay. Or we could easily imagine starting at the right and subtracting things out. So here you think of this as starting at the left, adding some number of jumps to get to where we are, or starting at the right and subtracting some number of jumps. Okay? So sort of we can think of this a little more graphically. Think of a, um, our, a conservation law where our F is really given by AQ. <clears throat> what we want to do is construct numerical fluxes and how we'll do that, and, and so we said, well, you can do, if I can compute a Q star, then I can do that, and Q star is going to be QI minus 1, so this little value here plus the jump here, that'll give me this Q star, or I can start at QI, subtract out some, a couple scalar multiples of eigenvectors to get here. In any case, my numerical flux, which I said was the approximate, you know, is approximately the time average of our, our flux function evaluated at, at this, this, this interface, which in our case just happens to be, this, the, our flux function is particularly simple, um, it's just A times Q star. That would be our numerical flux. And so this would be a way to actually code up a problem like this. I haven't given you all the details, and in fact tomorrow is where I'll talk. This, this is in fact essentially what, what GeoClaw is doing is computing these eigenvectors, computing these weights alpha, and, and, um, and, 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 and if you looked at the code tonight, you might not see all of this in there. It might look a little confusing, so I'll say more about it tomorrow. But this is essentially what GeoClaw is doing, okay, in a nonlinear regime, in an approximate Riemann solver case. But, but that's the idea, okay? So these, these fluxes, 
something like fluxes are computed and in fact the update to the solution is done in something like this manner, okay? Um, I guess I should ask questions. Are there any questions? <laughs> no, okay. I mean, you should, you should feel free to speak up, although I do feel like I've got, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm doing okay on time, so I'm not, I'm not going to worry. Okay, well, let's see. All right, so now we've got to solve the nonlinear. Okay, one, uh, linearized shallow water. Okay, so if you took those nonlinear shallow water wave equations, you, you, you put in sort of a mean state plus a perturbation, you got rid of higher order perturbations, you would end up with a system of equations that look like this, okay, where u is kind of a constant background velocity, h is sort of a mean field height, and g is gravity, okay? And our two variables are h and u, okay? So strictly speaking, this may not be a conservation law because u is not, strictly speaking, con conserved, but, but that's okay. We're not going to worry about that too much. Uh, we can compute the eigenvectors, eigenvalues of this matrix. It's lambda 1 is u minus square root gh and u plus square root gh. We can compute the eigenvectors, okay? Um, uh, and we can write down the exact solution. We have to, first of all, decompose our jump. It's sort of given an arbitrary jump, q right and q left. We decompose it um, to obtain our, our weights for the, alpha, for the eigenvectors. Um, and they, they, uh, the, the weights end up, I uh, didn't actually carry out the, the matrix algebra here, but you can just simply multiply this matrix times the jumps in H and the jumps in U here, and you can write down an exact solution. It's Q left plus, it's just Q left if we're sort of far enough to the left, it's Q right if we're far enough to the right, and it's some intermediate state. This is an example where there's only two waves, so this is, so don't, so there's only two, sort of three sections to, three pieces to worry about. And here, if you're somewhere in between, you need to start with Q left and add some scalar multiple of, say, the first eigenvector, okay? So that's, that's essentially what, what Claude, and if you were to go look at the code, I have an example online, I think on the Piazza site, where I've coded up this example, and you can look at the Riemann problem for this example, and you'll see something that looks pretty much like this, okay? And of course, the solutions, if I sort of start with a zero velocity field and a height field that's kind of perturbed around a, um, uh, uh, a mean state of, let's see, what did I do here? I guess I'm only plotting the perturbations h, so the mean state, I, assume, I think I set to five or something, and you can watch how how this, this solution, this is the solution to the Riemann problem, how it kind of propagates out, okay? And here the waves are moving with sort of speed u minus square root gh, u plus square root gh, and they just simply will propagate out indefinitely. And here you can see there's been a, a perturbation to the velocity field. So in fact, in here, the, the, the fluid is really, is really moving, even though it looks like it's a constant height. The fluid is in fact moving, and that's kind of what's, what's feeding this, this shock, or sort of, it's not really a shock, but you, what's feeding this wave at the front here. Um, so that example is coded up, and that's in fact, I'll say something about the labs at the end, but, but I have this example sort of, uh, in, uh, sort of have it set up so you guys can kind of play with it. Um, uh, okay, so now we want to get into the, slowly sort of work our way into the nonlinear problem. The nonlinear problem thing, life is not quite so simple, okay? But, but in fact, what I've tried to do is make it as simple as possible. So, so hopefully I, I didn't go too overboard. Um, we could have thought of this problem slightly differently. We could have said, I have a Q left, a Q right, and now I just need to find some intermediate state that somehow connects these two states to each other, okay? So I so could have said, ask the question, is there a Q star such that Q star minus Q left, well, we already know, what it is. It's some scalar multiple of the eigenvector, okay? Um, if I multiply through by A, what I essentially get is this kind of expression. I get A, and this, this seems kind of trivial in the linear case. You'll see in the nonlinear case, this, isn't, this turns out to be fundamental, but in the linear case, A times Q star minus QL is simply lambda times Q star minus QL. And we, this actually has a name, and, and if I replace a q star with f of q star in this sort of special case, this actually has a name. It's called a ranking hugonio jump condition. And, and in this special case, it's, uh, 
uh, it's simply the jump condition for the, for the scalar. We don't often use that term in the scalar, scale linear constant coefficient case, but, but it, 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 it's analogous to what we'll see in the nonlinear case, okay? Um, I could have asked the question for a two by two system, you know, find a state Q star such that across each wave, this expression is satisfied. So some middle state Q star minus QL is equal to lambda times Q star minus QL. And I find a state QR such that QR minus Q star is equal to lambda 2 times QR minus Q star. Well, if I had phrased the question that way, um, you would have very quickly realized, oh, I have to find, you know, like Q star. You would have, you would have quickly figured out that you would, you would basically be solving the, the eigenvalue problem that we already did, okay? This, this would be a little bit of a backwards way of doing it, but you could have done it that way. So, you know, find left and right states. Uh, so you can think of these left and right states as being connected by this intermediate state Q star. And that's how we have to think about the nonlinear case, okay? So um, again, we could have asked the question, find an intermediate Q state Q star such that, such that this is satisfied across each, each, of, these, each of these jumps, okay? Um, it's a little bit putting the cart before the horse, but, but that's the way we need to think about the nonlinear case, okay? Again, reminder, okay, <laughs> uh, what, what is happening? Going back to this idea, what we said is that the solution is constant along characteristics. DDT of Q is evaluated at some X of T, okay? And we said this is only true if X of T, we did this for the scalar case. I'm now just kind of reiterating this in the, 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 the systems case. So this will be true if X of T, X prime of T, Q of X is equal to A times Q of X. Well, what does that say about, about X prime of T? It has to, x prime of t must be an eigenvalue of a, okay? So that tells us that, in fact, the slope of these lines are given by eigenvalues of this linear, of this constant coefficient matrix, okay? And notice that they're all parallel. It didn't, the, since, the, since the eigenvalues are constant, it doesn't matter whether I start from the left and go out or start, start from the left and go out or start from the right. Uh, characteristics coming from either side are parallel, so that's all fine. Things over here, we always, we never get anything very interesting. We're always coming from both the left. No matter which direction we look, our solution's always coming from the left. No matter which direction we look, our solution's always coming from the right. It's only kind of in this middle state that we kind of get stuff coming from both sides, okay? So now to the nonlinear case. Um, now I can do this in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I think I have 15 minutes. Okay. So again, let's think about this uh, nonlinear sh uh, shallow water equations. Again, our Q is now H and momentum, so it's not simply H and U, it's H and UH. F of Q is uh, given by this, this expression here. So we think of, you know, F as depending on Q and, um, yeah. For smooth solutions, we could rewrite this as f prime of q times qx, okay, where f prime is what we call a flux Jacobian matrix. So f prime of q in some sense plays the role of our constant coefficient uh, matrix in, in the previous example. We'll turn out that it, 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 it is not that simple, but, um, but this is sort of the starting point for how we want to think about this. So let's go back to this idea you know, we can still ask, are there characteristic curves on which the solution remains constant? Well, let's see. If I simply, okay, let's do the same trick. DDT of Q evaluated at X of T is, you know, again, apply our chain rule, Q D, uh, Q D T, uh, D Q D T plus X prime, and X prime, again, is a scalar. Remember, this is a scalar quantity, times QX is zero. Okay, when will that be true? Well. Our, if we have a smooth solution, this will be true if f prime of q times qx is equal to x prime of t times qx. That is, x prime of t has to be an eigenvalue of our flux Jacobian. Okay, so again, characteristics, the slope of these characteristic curves are going to be governed by the eigenvalues of the flux Jacobian. Okay, 
So it's easy enough to compute the eigenvalues of this matrix. This is what makes these methods tractable, is that we're really dealing with very small matrices. You know, in, in 2D, we have a, a 3 by 3 case. In 3D, we have a, a, or a 2D shallow water, we have a 3 by 3 matrix. In 1D, it's a 2 by 2 matrix. We can easily compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. OK, again, they, they look real similar to the, to the linear case. Um, except that now these things, the key difference is that the eigenvalues now depend on u and h. They depend on our solution, OK? <coughs> and you'll notice here that the eigenvectors now involve u, whereas in the linear case, they didn't. OK, so that's really the crucial difference between the, lin the constant coefficient case and the nonlinear case is this dependence of all this data on, on q. So what does this mean? Weird things can start to happen, right? So I have characteristics that, in the, say, uh, in, in, the, in the case where I'm looking at, say, lambda 1, the, the slope are given by ur minus ghr. So if I'm over here at some qr, if q left and q right are different, there's no guarantee that these two sets of characteristics are parallel. OK, so we have weird things happening, right? All of a sudden, what goes on in here? There's a big gap here, you know? The Q lefts are going this way, and the Q right's going this way. What does the solution look like in here? Then it appears that nobody goes there. It's kind of a no man's land, right? What about in here? We have some sort of collision happening. You know, I've got stuff coming from both sides. Do I, do I add them up? You know, in the linear case, we just kind of added things up. What do we do? You know, uh, it's somehow, all of a sudden, life gets complicated. And this is where I'll try to explain all of sort of you know, <laughs> conservation law theory in three slides. But here we go. <laughs> All right, so let's take this. One, one thing you do notice about these two cases is that the slopes, we could make a, one definite statement about these that distinguishes these two cases. Here, the slope on the left is greater than the slope on the right. That is, the eigenvalue, this eigenvalue here, so lambda 2 evaluated at q left, is bigger than lambda 2 evaluated at q right. And that's why they're crashing. Here, and this is lambda 1, it, you can easily imagine, I could have easily reversed these. We could easily have, have sort of a crash here and a big gap right here, OK? Um, here, lambda 1 evaluated at q left is less than lambda 1 evaluated at q right. That's why we have this big gap. So the first one I want to focus on is this case where where they, the, the left eigenvalues are sort of overtaking the right eigenvalues, OK? So that's this particular case here. Well, we can sort of see, well, what really goes on in a neighbor? In, in, if suppose we had some, we know they can't really crash, so something has to happen. Well, what we can kind of do is say, let's take a tiny box around where we think the solution should have a jump, OK? So we'll take our conservation law, we'll integrate it, and we'll sort of say, you know, things, everything's constant here, it's constant here, it's constant here, and it's constant here. So we'll just replace this integral, and this, this could be something you can easily show, with an expression that looks like this, OK? Q left at the top minus Q right, Q, Q left, this top value minus this value divided by T dt looks something like a time derivative, and this, this expression here looks something like the integral of the flux right here. OK, and so we can do that. And actually, what we then end up with is an expression which looks, which in fact is the Rankine Hugonio jump condition. So across jumps, or across this sort of place where, these, where these, these, these characteristics collide, we have to satisfy something like this, OK, where s is what we're going to call a shock speed. So what we, insert, what we do is we put a shock in here. So we allow these, these characteristics to kind of impinge on this straight line. Now notice that the slope of this line is neither the slope of this line or the slope of this line. It's some other slope that you have to actually get by solving this equation. Okay? For, and again, this is a system. So we have to solve this equation for the system to get s. All right? um, and that's, that's, a simple, that, that's the shock condition. Okay? This is where these shocks come from in these nonlinear problems. I think Ridge had a, an example of Berger's equation where you saw this sort of thing happening. Okay? The rarefaction case is a little more complicated. I assure you it leads to sort of simple formulas, but I'll, this, is the, this is the worst slide. Okay? So now I've got to figure out what goes on in this big gap here. Well, so here's, here's the case where, where one guy, you know, this guy isn't just fast enough to overtake this one, so we're sort of left in kind of this, this no man's land here. 
So what we do, and this is a little bit, you know, okay, so, so we kind of say, well, let's parameterize the solution in this region. We'll parameterize it by the speed, okay, we're looking, we're only interested in sort of lambda 1. We'll parameterize, remember, according, you know, using this, we kind of know that, that Q prime is a pro, is, 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 has to be, uh, has to be um, proportional to an eigenvector, okay. So we can, you know, start out with a statement like this, differentiate it, so we get this weird kind of thing, the gradient of the lambda evaluated at Q, dotted with Q prime, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. We end up, what we end up with is sort of an ODE, okay? And, and this looks kind of horrendous, but in fact, it turns out to be quite simple to solve um, because, again, we're dealing with two by two matrices. These, this, is a, this is a scalar in the denominator, which will never be zero. The theory kind of tells us that. Um, this is simply, a, we end up with a system of two ODEs that turn out to be quite simple to solve. And if we do that, so this, we need to solve this system. We need to give it, with these boundary conditions, okay, and there's some, we have to use some Riemann invariants to actually get unknown constants that will show up, okay. This is where it maybe gets a little, little involved, but this is as much as I'm going to say about it, all right. <laughs> so, so basically, we do have a way to figure out what the solution looks like in here. And it simply is what's called a centered rarefaction wave. Okay. So what did we do? Um, we found a Q star such that Q left, so that solving the Riemann problem in the nonlinear case says find Q star such that Q left is connected to Q star by a physically correct one shock or rarefaction. So we need to put a shock or rarefaction in here. We need to put a shock or rarefaction in here. Everything needs to be physically correct. We can't violate entropy conditions. Um, and so, and, and this, this in fact leads to the need, so since we need to find a Q star that simultaneously does these two things, you can, it's not hard to imagine that we're going to have to solve something, okay? And in fact, what we end up solving, and this is a picture of what we do, we sort of imagine in, here we are in state space, here's H and here's HU, here's a Q left, so this is, might be a situation where our velocity is zero initially, and we have a height. Our left height is greater than our right height, okay? So we have to find some intermediate state that's somehow going to, you know, sort of that, that Q star state. Well, we have, we can, we can, so doing sort of what I described in the previous two slides, we can actually come up with curves of all the states that are connected by a rarefaction wave to Q left, all the states that are connected by a shock wave to Q right, find the intersection, and that's exactly the state that we want. To do this, we actually have to solve a nonlinear scalar equation, okay? This is not often done. I'll, I'll say that right now. Um, perhaps on GPUs, all of this would be trivial, but historically, people don't often do this, but this is exactly what what needs to happen to, in an exact Riemann solver, okay? And then we finally need to determine the structure of a rarefaction if there is one, and that turns out to be easy. Um, I think in the lab session, what I, what I will try to do is set up a solver that, that you can actually play with so you can get a sense for what it looks like. So here's, here's an example of the solution, okay? So you have to kind of remember what the, what the linear solution looked like. But here would be sort of a classic case in which you have a shock here, a rarefaction here. Keep in mind the situation could easily have been reversed. We could have two shocks, two rarefactions, a rarefaction on the right, a shock on the left, any number of things. I, I just sort of chose this as an example. Um, so here we have, again, our height perturbation is now a true height field. It's not just a perturbation to a mean state. It's an actual perturbation true height, a zero velocity. And what does the solution do? Well, here you can actually see the effects of the shock. So a sharp, this is a mathematically perfect jump. Numerically, it's slightly smeared out, but, but let's just focus on the, the actual, you know, sort of exact solution. Here we see our intermediate state that was somehow between our Q left and our, our Q left state and our Q right state. So this was kind of that intermediate state we had to solve for. And here we can see the rarefaction wave sort of spreading out. It starts out kind of steep in here, sort of it's not spread out over a very wide region here, but as we get up here, it's spread out over a wider region right in here. And here you see the effects of the rarefaction in the velocity field as well. 
This is actually momentum, so that's why it looks like the momentum. It looks like in the nonlinear case, the, the velocity is much larger than it was in the, in, the, in the linear case. And it just so happens that this is really h times u and not just u. So I probably could have figured out how to plot just u, but I, I didn't. So anyway, so, so that's the nonlinear example. So I have those two examples in the lab that um, I hope you can, you know, and, and, but I'll say, let me say, finish up here, and I'll say a couple things about the lab. So the question is, can we avoid doing this nonlinear solve? We don't want 2D, we don't want to be doing a bunch of nonlinear solves at every single cell interface. And the answer is yes. So that's, that's what I'll talk about tomorrow. Um, how does this extend to 2D? I gave a nice theory for 1D, but 2D, you know, what do we do? Um, and what does GeoClaw do? Okay. Um, so that's kind of what I'll, I'll say something about this tomorrow. This is all taken from, most of this was taken, <laughs> taken from a book written by Randy Levesque. Um, I have a copy here if anybody's interested. Uh, probably one of the, the better descriptions of all of this. Um, and in the lab session, what I have in mind is experimenting. I, I guess what I really have in mind, so today, so Dave George is here today, and so I, those of you who are working on GeoClaw projects should really sort of continue working on your GeoClaw project. Um, but tomorrow, I have in mind that, that uh, you would spend at least a little bit of time looking at these two examples. And if I get enough written up, I may even suggest that you write an exact Riemann solver. It's sort of something that everybody should do once in their life. And I'll set it up so maybe it won't be too hard. Um, and the idea would be that you would learn something about how the Riemann solvers are used in ClawPack and GeoClaw. Um, you know, and I have said nothing about bathymetry, but, but this would be part of the lab. Various plotting parameters. And um, I would like you to leave this workshop with at least a simple linear shallow water solver in 1D. Okay? And, and nonlinear shallow water wave equation. It's always handy to have these things in your sort of in your, your toolkit, right? So if you don't already have one, the goal would be that you would leave with, with at least that.